Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'll see if I don't have as much trouble with these uh, electronic devices Bert just had. Um, see if it works. If you want to, yeah, it works. If you want to download the slides of this talk, you can do it via the URL presented or just use the QR code if you like. Just keep it up for a couple of seconds. And then you can put your telephones down, sit back and relax. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to speak after Per. Um, I will have some stuff in my presentation which really continues on that previous talk. Um, but to start with, I think this is an important study which is a 15 year follow up from UEFA data. And they showed that there is a slight decrease of time, of time loss hip and groin injury over time. But what was, what was interesting is that the hip and groin injury burden, so the time that people are off the pitch, pretty much remains the same. And what was notable as well for me as a physiotherapist is that um, we're not dealing maybe good enough with these injuries because there's a high number of recurrencies. So if we want to do our rehab well, we may look better into what we do with the patient and we may not say too easily, hey, if you get rid of your pain, just go back to the pitch and let me know when, when things go wrong. We may extend somehow what we do. Um, and we all know, and that was just presented as well by Per, that from the study from Andrea, that there's no such thing as a single risk factor. You can be somehow weaker than others and therefore maybe at a higher risk. But um, it's more than that. It's uh, getting an injury can be a really complex uh, situation. Many factors may play a role. Like last Christmas, it's, an, it's a well-known song, but um, it, there were many coaches in the Premier League who were complaining in the press about the high level of stress on their athletes because of the playing schedule, which was really dense. We can label that as the acute chronic workload ratio. But on the other hand, if you have a prize and you're in a tournament as a player, you want to go for that prize, you may not note too much about your complaints you may not go to your medical staff, you may keep it for yourself and therefore be at a higher risk. Uh, although you're in a good situation with a lot of care around you. So your player status, your career status may play a role as well. But transfers, when you're in a transfer situation, you've got a lot of stress and noise around you, it may increase the risk for an injury. So it's not that simple. And we know that factors in that specific athlete, like age or previous injury or, or lower fitness levels, they play a role as well. So um, we should accept that. It is an illusion to nip every injury in the bud. And uh, we cannot prevent any injury we like. Can then prevention models, can then thinking about curation and prevention, can they assist us in what we do in the clinic? And normally we, we can follow a four-step four approach by establishing the extent of the injury, by studying incidents and severity, and then we can do uh, studies on uh, the mechanism of the injury, why are things happening or why do things or problems keep on coming back, um, and then we can, can, we, then we can take uh, preventive measures. Um, but is that all? Is there, is there some more light behind this model that we should, uh, should note? Um, there's much known about numbers of injury, epidemiological data, uh, in terms of time loss, which are well described in the literature. But we also know from literature that there's a lot of people who are walking around while they experience problems, while still being in play. And there's some data on that. And the hip and groin outcome score, I'm a big fan of using it because you can monitor the group of athletes you are dealing with and it really gives you a good insight in what's happening in these guys. But is, is that just counting injuries and just doing scores, is that all? Is that, um, is that really the true reality of that athlete? And I think I want to stress this, this work from an Amsterdam colleague, Carolyn Bolling, she just defended her PhD. And what she did was not doing so much the scientific number counting, but what she did, she had a lot of interviews with athletes and coaches and high performing artists. And she asked them, well, we do the number counts of injuries, but 
when do you consider yourself injured? And the funny thing was that, see if it works. No, it doesn't connect too good. Yeah, what she found was, no, skip it. Let's keep it low tech. Um, what she found was that a lot of these guys, they said, I have symptoms and I have pain up to some degree, and I'm pretty fine with that. Not so much of a problem with me. It makes me getting into problems when I cannot reach my performance levels again. So pain and symptoms up to some degree, we look at it as, as non-time loss, it's not always an injury, but it is an injury when they cannot perform on their previous levels again then they consider themselves injured. And they get out of play, they get into a time loss situation when they are not able to manage the situation for themselves. Or they start worrying, they have too much levels of pain and they drop out. So what we did is we did a reanalysis re of, of uh, Hagel's data. And uh, we found that on the left side, you see a graph of three lines, which is the classical, the, the classical um, uh, what do you say, um, groups of people without pain. The red line is the people with complaints, but still in play. And the green line is those with time loss. And you can see easily that these are different groups based on the hypnoid outcome scores and uh, uh, several uh, differences in heights of scores. But when we enter the new group with normal performance with pain and symptoms, we saw a fourth group coming up. So this is the group that will play on as long as they can still perform, but may have considerable levels of pain and symptoms experienced at that time. So these are the people we may need to monitor more, cl more closely uh, before they come to us. May, we may need to actively ask them how they are going. And that's when the Hagas may help us. So, um, when we put this into the model by Van Mechelen, um, we can say we do not only count the incidence and severity, but also take into account symptoms and performance levels, and then look where they experience their problems. And for football players, it's usually kicking, kicking and sprinting. And then we can, we can rush into our treatment or prevention programs, but we need to better understand what they need to do and how the body works in order to design uh, adequate prevention programs. And then we can take the preventive measures or a curative measure, whatever you like, depending on the situation of that athlete. But if you call the word prevention, um, prevention is not sexy. I mean, when we talk about prevention, if you say to me, well, think about your diet or think about your weight, because that needs to be reduced because you're at a higher risk to develop health problems over time, I think about negative things. I may drink less, I may eat less, whatsoever. So prevention is somehow a negative uh, sound. And even for he serious health problems, uh, prevention is still a big problem to deal with. So we may think about uh, marketing. How should we market that? I think, uh, <clears throat> I think this ad shows us that if you want to promote alcohol-free beer or light beers, that you should not talk about preventing uh, traffic death or uh, show all the miserable things that may happen while you're drunk and driving. You can just make a nice ad and put some sexiness in there and some fun in there and people like it and they off a bit and, and embrace that brand that's how that's how marketing works and it's even if you look at sports and 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 drinks and soft drinks and whatsoever there is a strange thing about marketing because if you look at this Ronaldo player and you see that he's been I, I understand him being sponsored by Nike no deal 
but why does Kentucky Fried Chicken sponsor this guy? I mean, if you go too often to the Kentucky Fried Chicken, you won't have a body like that. So, um, they are very smart in marketing their brand, officiate with famous players whatsoever. And it works for a lot of things. We know that prevention works, and also for Durex. I mean, this is may this maybe not the best context to make the ad. I mean, it can be pretty distracting when you enter that tunnel uh, with your car. But we all know that this type of advertising attracts a lot of attention. So, if we talk about prevention, should we then say, well, I've got a good proposal. You have never been injured, but do this type of exercises and we prevent you from future injury. That doesn't sell well, does it? But will it sell better if you say to your athletes, you got symptoms, you got pain. I can help you by doing a structured exercise program. And once you do it, you get rid of your pain, you get rid of your symptoms, but additionally, you will improve your motor skills, you will increase your speed, and you will perform better in your specific context. That sells better, does it? Because a lot of people don't want to do the extra exercises we think in our office. Okay? So, we must be very careful with the clinical pearls, and I think Andreas will talk about this later this day, the clinical pearls we have in the literature, we know that some things have really good effects, but we also know that, and it's the same with hamstring prevention, we also know that keep doing it is a big problem for the athlete. At the beginning it's new and it's attracting, but at a sudden they get bored, so you have to offer new things in your clinic. So if you talk about performance, you may show some data uh, that once you're fit and you have less injuries, your performance will get better. And on the individual level, that's an open door. But also on the team levels, you will perform better once you le your level of injuries will go, go down. And then we have to understand what is the problem that with, with that specific performance loss. And then we can look into more biomechanical, and I'm also, I'm always happy when I, when I look, I've listened to, to um, presentations about biomechanics, because we can learn so much from data obtained in a laboratory setting or from the pitch by understanding what's really, happen what's really happening and what these athletes have to do. And you see that um, the athlete is all it's about is about proper timing, is about proper range of movement, is about proper strength and proper technique. And we have to incorporate that in our clinic and what we do with the athlete. So we have to understand that if you, many people with groin pain, they say, well, I can kick a ball, but I cannot kick it maximally any, anymore. When I speed up my shot, I get into trouble. What happens when you kick harder uh, when compared to a submaximal kick, we know that the time of the kick will be less, the time of the kick, the duration of the kick will get less, but your angles of your joints, they get larger. So there's more tissue stress. There's, more, it, 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 there's no other way than there's higher tissue stress in maximal kicking. So we need to incorporate speed into our rehab at a given moment. And we can read the literature. We can look at observa observations from, from colleagues who said previously that what you often find in people with some impingement in this region, it was observed that they have overactive or facilitated quadratus lumborum and overactive adductors. And the consequence thereof may be anterior overload and we often see in an anteriorly tilted position. So we need to improve range of movement into that specific situation, which really connects to the remark I purchased in the previous presentation, that it's not a single muscle, but all muscle in that region working together in a coordinated manner. So we developed this test in order to see if we find, if we could detect proper movement, what we found 
is that if you test these patients into a more three dynamical way, that you see that people with groin pain show to be less flexible in that specific side where they experience their complaints. So we need to improve that into our uh, treatment strategy. And when we think about energy transfer throughout the body, we just need to put pieces of the puzzle together and just look at all these tiny things and see if they deserve a place into the active rehab st uh, uh, strategy. And we found that people with groin pain have reduced ability to actively posteriorly and, active and anteriorly tilt their pelvis. So reduced range of movement throughout, also in an active manner, should be restored. And why is it then? I think that we should look at these injuries in a more mechanistic way, and maybe it's not so much that there is one specific injury mechanism for every entity or for every single problem, there may be a more bigger clinical picture which we can de uh, detect when we look into the biomechanics. Um, and that is then the next step. The next step is how can we look into specific tasks or specific function. If we think that high-speed actions are required in a sport-specific context, then we should study it as, as such. So if we think that load transfer around the pelvic region is a problem, we should do some testing. Here we do a test with a self-developed uh, motion, motion capture system. And we can look at hip and spine angles and the speeds uh, that are produced at that specific task. And you can see that this guy, this goalkeeper, experiences problems for the rate of force development that we are asking in this specific task. So we think that this needs to be uh, restored during the rehab. And at the end, and at the end, you may combine all these pieces together in a bigger rehab program, applying neurocognitive tasks together with strength training and speed training as well and bring these guys back to the pitch. So, to conclude, there is, we should focus on injury determinants next to time loss alone, and performance-related looking into that athlete should be considered important. Listen to the voice of the athlete. A groin injury rarely travels alone. We need to look at a, bin, a bigger clinical picture. And if we do some rehab, we need to incorporate content that can be explained. Every exercise serves its own goal. So think about what you do, but more importantly, why you do it. And if we want to talk about prevention and get them aboard and keep them aboard, think about that we need to market it right. So put a little fun and a little sex appeal in the things we do with these uh, athletes. Thank you so much.